Next, we're going to go through um, the, the FAQs that are coming through the helpline and our inquiries form. So just, just remember that anything that you have a question about, you can contact our helpline. It doesn't matter, you know, how silly a question. Um, we're absolutely fine. That's what the helpline is there for, to try and help your understand, aid your understanding so that you're getting a really clear pers perspective on what expectations are. And, you know, very often I'll receive feedback from my calls at the end of the call that will say, I'm actually really glad I, glad I called because I had that the wrong way around or my perception of what was expected or what someone told me is actually not accurate. So I'm glad I called. And I think that's really important because you might be getting guidance from people who've been through heart audits before who may have a different view on things. So if you have a question, I encourage you to call. If I don't know the answer straight away or I need to seek some guidance, I'll make sure that I get back to you. But um, yeah, never never be you know shy to call the helpline um, when you need some advice. So one of the key areas where we receive quite a lot of feedback or questions about is retention samples and shelf life. And we have put a lot of this information in the guidance, but that's okay. Like um, it, it's good to sort of really clarify what we're looking for in these particular areas. So one of the questions I get quite often is, why do I need to keep a whole carton of produce? How on earth am I supposed to keep all of these cartons? They take up so much space. They're taking up all my cool room. What am I supposed to do with all this product? Well, let's just set the record straight. The retention sample that we're requiring is just that, a sample. It can be representative of what you think your customers, the end consumers typically purchase, not necessarily the retailers. So you don't have to keep a, an OM12 crate of lettuce, as an example, or whatever they are, eight. Um, you can keep the weight or size of what would a, con a consumer would typically buy, and that is also sufficient. In addition, you don't actually need to keep a sample for each retailer if you produce the same product for multiple retailers. That's fine to keep one, but just consider in that process that you're rotating across all of the retailers. So you're getting a good representation of all of those products over time. So just to clarify, we are not, auditors are certainly not expecting to walk in and see a wall of product um, every time just in relation to retention samples. So that sort of leads into the next question, which is how often should I be collecting these retention samples? Our standard does say daily or weekly, and that probably causes a few people to scratch their heads. That decision is really based on you and what you feel is the frequency that's right based on a risk assessment. So what, what do we mean when we're talking about a risk assessment? It really should consider product safety and any quality risks along with the volume that's actually being supplied. So obviously, if you are uh, like before Easter, like Bruce was talking about pushing through a lot more volume of product, you might want to keep more retention samples. But variability of the product is really the key influencer in your decision of how many retention samples you ought to keep. If you're seeing that the product is particularly uniform, so the growing conditions or the environmental conditions have been particularly stable, Obviously, you need to keep fewer retention samples, but if there's been a really high degree of variability, including that increase for, for orders and things like that, it might actually be beneficial to keep a few more retention samples. That decision is up to you. It's just up to you to justify why you're making those decisions. Sticking on the area of retention samples and shelf life, some of the questions are, in my supply chain, who's actually responsible for maintaining that retention sample? So we've got a little information about this in our scheme rules as well. The responsibility typically lies with the business that's applying the end label and the best before date if that's actually applicable to your product. And we know that that's not always applicable. It's more about the end label on the product. Typically speaking, it's a tier one. However, that's not always the, the case. And especially where we have tier two suppliers that have the responsibility of delivering directly to the retailer's distribution center. In another instance, if a product requires ripening, so mangoes or um, bananas, for example, it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep the retention sample at the farm. 
because the product's going to go through ripening and that will obviously create some fundamental changes to the product quality. So in those particular cases, we would expect that the um, final point, the ripener, or maybe the tier one's facility is where the retention sample should be kept. That decision again is up to you as a business and what the auditor might be looking for in that instance is what is the agreement between your business as a tier two and the tier one supplier or the ripener who's responsible for maintaining those retention samples because it, it needs to be someone someone within that supply chain and finally what's the importance of collecting these retention samples they just end up going on moldy on my shelf and i throw them away well retention samples have been highly highly valuable in past situations and they can assist with such a various range of issues things like verifying compliance to label weights and measures and when product needs to be tested if there has been an exceedance of a maximum residue limit and in addition quality related rejections and things like that as well so there are multiple reasons where retention samples can aid and assist the process particularly if you're getting feedback from retailers or your T1 suppliers about how the performance of product is going. The next section that I wanted to touch on is the HARPS standard relating to HACCP training, because we have had some changes there and we do get some questions about these particular areas. So the first question is around what's a HARPS practitioner? I can see that's actually something new in this version of the standard. And can my consultant be that practitioner? So we do have a definition which is in the glossary at the back of both the HARP standard and the guidance document. The HARPS practitioner must be a representative of the, the organisation that is an employee and is responsible for managing the implementation of HARPS. They need to really be accountable for HARPS within the business. If that employee is a consultant, you really need to question how much time they're actually spending in your business. Do they effectively contribute to the ongoing compliance of your organisation? The real question about that consultant is, are they considered an employee of your organisation or do they stop by once a year or perhaps twice a year to go through your internal audit and that's about it, then they're off again. We would like the knowledge to sit within the business to ensure that Everything that's um, up to date and relevant to HACCP is able to be shared within your own business. The second question is really around fresh care training, which in version one was actually acceptable as a refresher for element 5.2 in version one. As you've probably noticed, the numberings changed because we've actually taken um, a section out of the standard and training now sits within elements 4.1 and 4.2 of the version 2 standard. So as HACCP refresher training is now requested to be conducted by a registered training organisation or a certified trainer that's actually affiliated with an RTO, fresh care training is no longer acceptable under the version 2 standard. However, it is important to note that any training that was completed prior to the version 2 standard is acceptable. So we, you don't need to start with version 2 and say, oh, that, that training that I did with Fresh Care last year for refresher is no longer valid. It is for the three years. You'll need to do your training in HACCP refresher after a three year period. I also wanted to touch on some of the FAQs that are coming up in relation to the HARP scheme rules and talk a little bit about the certification bodies that represent HARPs in terms of completing HARPs audits. So some of the questions I get asked around who should I choose? What should I do? Which direction should I go in in terms of certification bodies? And, or I'm not necessarily happy with my CB right now. What choices do I have? So the appendix to certification body matrix is available online. And um, this basically provides an overview of all of the certification bodies that can conduct audits whether you're a tier one business or a tier two business. And if you are a tier one that operates as a tier two, look for the table that says tier one suppliers. So for those tier one suppliers, we actually define who the business can use by the retailer. 
So for Aldi, as an example, there is a list of seven certification bodies that can conduct audits for harps. Similarly for Coles, and once you go across to the right hand side, you know, a lot of those names are the same, the business names are the same, but for some reasons, there are businesses that accept fewer certification bodies. Harps doesn't make that decision for tier one suppliers. The decision is made by the retailer. So please be mindful of that if you're a tier one supplier. For the case of tier two suppliers, it's a little bit different. Uh, just a note there in relation to Costco suppliers, irrespective of whether you're a tier one or a tier two business, you do need to refer to the Costco list that sits under that table for tier one. But for every other retailer, that decision is made by the scheme's approval. So for example, let's have a look at fresh care, food safety and quality, because that's um, the standard that is most prolific under HARPS. There are a number of certification bodies that can conduct your audit, including ACO, Ausqual, BSI, Murio, Nutrisciences, Nutri Intertech, Cyqol International and SGS. So if you're a tier two supplier, you can refer to that list under, under tier two table there. So if you're doing SQF, they are the businesses that are listed that are approved to conduct the audit in conjunction with HARPS. So you have your SQF audit and HARPS, you can use Ausqual, BSI, Meriu, Intertech or SGS. So I hope that's clear to everybody. Um, if you have questions again, please give us a call if, you, if you're confused about um, what I should be referring to, what the rules are specifically around Costco, help me out with that. Um, all of those questions are really important to make sure that you're making the right decisions around which certification body to use. I also wanted to touch on just a couple of quick things in relation to working with certification bodies. I don't think it's any surprise to, to businesses out in the industry that there is not a, an infinite number of auditors available to conduct either the GFSI audits or HARPS. We do have quite a lot working out there, but scheduling your audit as early as possible when it's practical to you and when it's necessary, i.e. not unannounced, is really, really helpful. It provides um, information to the CB to allow them to schedule way in advance of when your audit takes place. And it can potentially lend to your audit being combined with other audits in the same region, which potentially can lo lower your um, travel costs for the audit as well. So early intervention, early scheduling is going to be really, really helpful with your audit. To try to assist with this process, we actually place key performance indicators on our certification bodies to really encourage them to actually schedule early with businesses as well. So don't be surprised if you are contacted three months before your regular audit cycle or audit month to try and get that date locked in. And I know it can be really hard as a grower in particular to envisage, am I gonna be packing? Am I gonna be harvesting? There are ways of working around this and ensuring that we look at records if you're not actually, you know, harvesting on the day um, due to, you know, rain or whatever happens, we will cons be considerate of that. So the auditor will be considerate of that or give us a phone call so we can make sure that everything goes smoothly on the day and there are no problems. But really important. So just ensure that you are sh uh, scheduling your audit nice and early. And obviously that might be more beneficial to, um, you know, helping all of the audits get scheduled but also might be helpful on your bottom line as well. Another question that we get asked in relation to HARP scheme rules is about the involvement of external consultants at the HARP audit. Now, we don't want to be dismissive of the role of external consultants because we know they certainly add value to your businesses, particularly to the businesses that are smaller and require external assistance because they have so many things that they need to do and they don't have quality managers or, or teams that they can actually support the process. But for the purpose of the audit, the, the auditor is really making an assessment of how many gaps exist between your the HARP standard and how your business is functioning. So having someone external to your business that's not actually involved in the day-to-day -day activities and how your business operates is really not beneficial to your business in the long run. What the auditor will be looking for 
is how you as a business can actually respond to the questions and your um, understanding of what is required of HARPS. So certainly the external auditor can be there from an observational perspective and, and you know, I encourage that to, to an extent as well so that they can take on the feedback, look at the, any non-conformances, treat that as continuous improvement. It's not a big stick approach if you get a non-conformance. It's an identification of a gap that needs to be reviewed. So let's look at root cause. How did that non-conformance occur in the first place? And let's look at the corrective action, which is really the sustainable management of implementing actions that will work for your business and meet the standards requirements. So if you ever have any concerns or issues around having your consultant there, um, please let us know in advance of your audit so that we can talk through that. You might be a little bit nervous if it's your first time going through an audit process, and certainly we can have some conversations to help guide you through that process.